Photography's look at the singers who once defined pop music. Tonight, Bobby Rydell, who went from South Philly to the top of the music world. Bobby Rydell still makes his living singing Wild One in Volare. Next month, he will be touring with fellow heartthrobs Fabian and Frankie Avalon. Rydell's career took off in the late 50s when Elvis departed for the Army and record labels searched for new teen idols. He had the requisite looks and charisma, along with a wealth of musical talent. Bobby Rydell was born to entertain. He's a triple threat, you know. He's an actor, he's a singer, he's a dancer. At 17, the world was at his feet. Screaming, surrounding him, all kinds of commotion. He's multifaceted. This man is one of the great actors. He was a star that Hollywood wanted, but Bobby wouldn't leave his hometown. In this business, you've got to be there at the right time and at the right place, at the right moment. And that 3,000 mile difference could have made the difference of Bobby being really a major uh, movie star. But to make a living, this South Philly boy traveled the globe, singing and drumming his way into the hearts of millions of fans. He's a great entertainer. He's a great singer. He just, he's still today, man. He has great chops. Give the audience more than they expect. He gives them from the heart, gives them from his voice. He loves the audience and they love him. You got the lips that I'm not about to. I got the lips that'll knock you out. In the early 1940s, South Philadelphia, Pennsylvania was a vibrant, busy neighborhood where dads went to work, mom stayed home, and everyone knew their neighbors. It was a working-class life where no one had much but what they did have, they shared. Jenny and Al Ritterelli lived in a primarily Italian area of the city. They lived in a row house with Jenny's parents who had immigrated from Italy. Bobby Rydell was born on April 26, 1942 in South Philly. His birth certificate read boy, Ritterelli. It took several weeks for his parents, Jenny and Al, to name him. His dad wanted to call him Antonio, but his mother didn't want everyone calling him Tony. They finally settled on Roberto. Though he was an only child, Bobby was never lonely. He lived with his parents and grandparents, who adored and entertained him. My father was uh, like an old Italian vaudevillian, you know? They used to have a, a, a club, and uh, my father used to tell jokes and uh, sing. Bobby's own talent for singing showed up very early. When Bobby was two, his father went into the army. Jenny would often write about Bobby's budding talent in her letters to Al. She would say, the baby's always singing. He won't shut up. And my father wrote back, and to this day, my mother still has the letter that my father wrote back. Who knows? Maybe one day we'll have a star in the family. He was a very active little boy, and uh, he was always singing. And then back of the car, he would sing, and I would say, shut up and go to sleep. <laughs> In the Ritterelli household, music was a constant companion. The entire family would listen to bands like Tommy Dorsey, Duke Ellington, and especially Frank Sinatra. One of six-year-old Bobby's favorite activities was to imitate all the actors he saw on television, like Jimmy Stewart. Wanting to encourage his young son's talent, Bobby's father often took him to the Saturday afternoon shows at Philadelphia's Earl Theater. The Earl was a venue where everybody who was anybody in the music business performed. It was here that Bobby saw legendary drummer Gene Krupa, and his world changed. And I said to my father, yeah, Dad, that's what I want to be. I want to be him. He started to play on the, uh, on the banister, you know, coming down the basement, you know, with the sticks. Bobby was going up the stairs, and my godmother said to Bobby, Bobby, are you going to be a priest? He said, oh, no, I'm going to be a drummer. That year at Christmas, Bobby received a special gift. When he woke up that morning, he found a toy snare drum under the tree. The little toy drum gave the young drummer a solid start. But Al Ritterelli knew that Bobby would need a real set of drums if he was going to realize his dream. 
But money was not easy to come by. Al worked long hours at the Electrolyte Carbon Company as a punch press operator. If he worked overtime, he could bring home $40 a week. Al Ritarelli feared he would never be able to afford a drum set for his son. Then one day, Al had an accident at work. There was one time he was working and he got his finger caught in the punch press and he got a, uh, a bonus, you know, because he lost part of his finger. And uh, part of that finger bought me my first set of real drums. <laughs> yeah, it was my first set of real drums because my dad lost half of his finger. With his mother's blessing and his father's constant encouragement, eight-year-old Bobby began life as a professional entertainer. In 1950, Bobby auditioned for Paul Whiteman's amateur show. The show was a chance for Bobby to shine. He sang, danced, did imitations, and played the drums. He was a big hit. Bobby was soon invited to be a regular on the show, and it was during this time that the show's producer suggested Bobby change his name from Ritarelli to something easier to pronounce, and Bobby Rydell was born. In 1953, the Whiteman show was canceled, and 11-year-old Bobby found himself out of work. Bobby refused to let that stop him. He began taking lessons with a local teacher, Sam D'Amico. He had a gift, and Bobby loved the drums. He never just banged the drums. He always played very, very musical, which is very important to be a drummer. To make sure Bobby got as much exposure as he could, Al Ritarelli took him to every club in town. My husband used to take Bobby around to the RDA club, Palumbo's, wherever he could bring him. And they had a girl singer there. She was the act. And they said, well, let's put this kid on. So they put Bobby on. And what can I tell you? I mean, the people went crazy. Young Bobby was developing a following all over Philadelphia. He'd become a fixture on the nightclub scene. The one place Bobby had trouble getting recognized was school. I honestly hated school. I loved the business so much that I, I wasn't really a good student. Uh, I, I, I would hooky a lot, you know, I, I'd miss classes. Academic life was not a priority for Bobby Rydell, but it hardly seemed to matter. With his mother and father's unwavering support, teenaged Bobby Rydell was poised for start. He had talent and he had drive. What he needed now was a break. You are watching Bobby Rydell. Clubs all over his hometown of Philadelphia. But the teenager was no closer to his dream of becoming a professional musician. Then in 1956, Bobby was invited to fill in for the drummer of a local band named Rocco and the Saints. The invitation came from the band's trumpet player, another South Philadelphian named Frankie Avalon. But I knew that he played real good drums. So we contacted him, and he came in, and he played uh, a couple, three weeks, I guess, with us, with Rocco and the Saints, as the drummer. Bobby did more than fill in on the drums. He practically stole the show. Bobby sang, danced, did a few impressions, exhibiting the full range of his talent. During one of these performances, talent agent Frankie Day was in the audience. After our set was over, he came over to, uh, to me and said, I'd like to manage you. I'm like 14, 15 years old. I said, I don't know, go talk to my mother, my father. And basically, that's how it all started. It was a handshake. That handshake was all that was necessary. With talent, determination, and representation, Bobby was ready to take the music world by storm. Bobby, his dad, and his new manager made the rounds at several record labels, including RCA, Capitol, Paramount, and MGM. The answer was always the same, no thanks. Finally, in 1957, Bobby signed a deal with Veco Records and went right to work. But success would not come quickly. I had three records. They all died. They all bombed. They did nothing whatsoever. I said, well, evidently, this is, this is not for me. This is, th this is not my part of the business. I was really happy playing drums. After eight years of lessons, drum teacher Sam D'Amico told Bobby he had nothing more to learn from him and suggested that Bobby find a music teacher in New York City. But 16-year-old Bobby didn't want to leave his family and made the choice to stay at home. Depressed and disillusioned, Bobby remained in Philadelphia. It seemed he had run out of prospects. No one was interested in him as an artist, but at least one person was interested in him as a boyfriend. Camille Quattrone was a South Philly girl who lived just blocks away from Bobby. She'd had her eye on him for months, 
but couldn't seem to get his attention. I would see him get on the trolley car, and I would try to meet him. I would talk to his friend, but he would never acknowledge me. A girl who lived across the street from me, her name was Mickey, and it was right across the street from the soda shop, you know, where we used to hang out, George's, it was called. And we were sitting on the step one night in the summertime, and we had the old RCA 45 record players, and we were listening, you know, to people like, you know, Bill Haley and the Comets, and at that time, Elvis Presley, the Everly Brothers. Uh, and uh, Mickey introduced me uh, to Camille. The two slowly began to fall in love. While his love life was taking off, Bobby's music career seemed to be going nowhere, but there was still hope. One thing that could make or break a singing career in the late 1950s was appearing on the wildly popular television show American Bandstand, shot right there in Philadelphia. More than any other single show at the time, American Bandstand and its host, Dick Clark, were a direct pipeline into the homes and hearts of teenagers across the United States. It was the ideal showcase for up-and-coming local talent, like Bobby Rydell. Many of the performers, many of the dancers, many of the kids came from South Philly, and I think it added to the aura of the neighborhood. And South Philly, I think, naturally became a very hip place, and Bobby was from there. Just because you happened to come from Philadelphia didn't automatically mean you were going to be played on American Bandstand, like Dick or every disc jockey in the world. It had to be in the grooves. If it wasn't in the grooves, it wasn't a hit record. All Bobby needed to do was find a song catchy enough to take to American Bandstand, and he did. In early 1959, Bobby had signed a deal with another company, Cameo Records. Bobby's record producer, Bernie Lowe, co-wrote a song called Kissing Time. Bobby recorded it, and they brought it to Clark. Now, I said, that's a hit, because I had real good ears in those days. I it wasn't psychic, but I had a real feel for it. In July of 1959, Dick Clark introduced 17-year-old Bobby Rydell singing Kissing Time on American Bandstand. Within three weeks of its release, Kissing Time became a national hit. Bobby was a star. not only a great singer, a great performer, but the kids could relate to him, especially the girls. That was very important in those days. You had to have girl appeal, and he had it. When a new record came out, everybody had to hear it. And you had so much exposure, so much promotion, so much hype. And they just ship it out right away. The DJs had it, start playing it. And, and Bobby would show up at the dances to promote your song, because he lived here. He was right here. And Dick Clark, of course, being based out of Philadelphia, gave him that national exposure to make him a superstar. A few months later, Bobby followed up Kissing Time with We Got Love. two hit songs on the playlist of every rock and roll station in America, there was no time for anything but his music. Bobby quit high school and began a six-week tour with Dick Clark's first rock and roll caravan. By the time the tour was over, We Got Love had gone gold and become his first top ten hit. A teen idol was born. It was on the boardwalk in Atlantic City across from the Steel Pier where Bobby was appearing, which was a, was a resort in, in that day. All of a sudden, a screaming started to come out of the steel pier. And it was Bobby Rydell coming out for some type of a photo shoot. And girls screaming, surrounding him, all kinds of commotion. You gotta remember the period. 
late 50s and 60s was probably the most innocent period of our lives as a country and as a people. And we just went through life. You had your idols and you yelled and screamed. We didn't have any problems, really. One of the things that made Bobby so popular was his clean-cut appearance. From the Letterman sweaters to the chinos and saddle shoes, Bobby personified the American teen idol. Then, of course, there was the pompadour. The pompadour. The pompadour. Bobby's hair was the most recognizable because, you know, you couldn't, if he turned sideways, you couldn't see him. You know, I used to refer to him all the time as Spila Beep. In Italian, that means pipe cleaner. That's how thin he was. Skinny or not, Bobby's image was a hit among the teenagers and among the older generation of listeners as well. They wanted to mother Bobby. Everybody wanted to be his sister. Everybody wanted to be his mom. I remember a lot of adults, every time I had Bobby Rydell on the stage, the audience was jam-packed with not only the kids, but the kids' mothers. My parents flipped over Bobby, went completely, completely fell in love with him. My father said, he's another Frank Sinatra. He just wasn't a good-looking kid. Bobby was a, a musician. He understood music. He'd been playing in clubs since he was eight years old. And now all the hard work and the unfailing dedication of his father had paid off. 17-year-old Bobby Rydell was a teen idol. But fame came at a price. Bobby would have to make compromises in his personal life that he had not bargained for. You are watching Bobby Rydell, part of Teen Idols Week on Biography. His hit songs were making an entire nation of girls in Bobby socks swoon. He had his dream. He was a teen idol. In the fall of 1960, Bobby followed up his runaway hits, Kissing Time and We Got Love, with an Italian song that his mother told him to sing, Volare. Volare had been previously released by Domenico Modugno, and Dean Martin. As a testimony to Bobby's popularity, his version of the song rocketed to number four on the Billboard charts. But fame held some surprises for Bobby. The life of a teen idol meant that his life was no longer his own. They'd be swamped. They couldn't really go anyplace. It was uh, loud, and they were screaming at you. I never knew why they were screaming at, at, you know, but they were screaming. And I was told that the louder the screams, is that you're becoming successful. I could never understand that. Because they could never hear you sing. Being a teenage idol has its ups and downs. You know, it's exciting and it's, it's terrifying. As Bobby's popularity increased, the fans grew more and more unpredictable. In 1961, at a stadium concert in Sydney, Australia, hysterical fans rushed the stage. Before he could sing a note, Bobby had to be quickly escorted out by police. Scary to get in, to get out of a building. I mean, security had to be unbelievable because the kids, specifically the girls, they wanted a piece of the, a tie, a cufflink, a, a, a piece of your whatever. I was up in San Francisco and these girls broke into a, a television station and pulled me out on the street and had me on the, on the pavement pulling hair out of my head for souvenirs. As a teen idol, Bobby had to be available for the dreams of every girl in America. So fame also meant he could not go out on a date. He was very much in love with Camille, but his manager would not allow her to be seen with him in public. I think Bobby's girlfriend was introduced to me the first time as his cousin. A cousin, a friend of the family. In those days, I was, you know, supposedly, quote, teenage idol. And there were a lot of girls out there who were thinking about marrying Bobby Rydell, you know, one day. So if you had a girlfriend, you know, taboo. I would have a different name because at that time, Bobby didn't have a girlfriend. And it wasn't good publicity at the time. So I would be called Joanne, I would be called Marianne, and never Camille. They were two teenagers in love, but Bobby had to call a friend to take Camille to her prom. Fame, however, did have its privileges. At 18, Bobby had access to stars he had idolized all his life, like George Burns, Bobby Darin, and Frank Sinatra. I walk into the club, and Carmine, head waiter, he said, uh, Bobby, would you like to sit with Frank? So my manager's name was Frank, Frankie Day. 
I said, well, no, no, no. I said, that, that's okay. I'll just go down and join, you know, my father and Frank and, and, and Huckabuck. He said, no, he said, Frank. Jules Podell walks up, hits Sinatra on the shoulder like that. I went, oh, my God. Oh, oh my God. He said, Frank, I want you to meet the kid. Sinatra stands up. He says, how you doing, Robert? I said, fine, Mr. Sinatra, how are you? He says, I'm wonderful. He said, would you care to join us? I said, I'd love to. He said, what do you drink? I said, C -c -c Coke. I figured if I said scotch and water, he'd smack me in the face. <laughs> but what a wonderful evening. And I called my mother. I think it was about 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. And I said, Mom! Mom! I just met God! <laughs> The early 1960s were a whirlwind of activity for Bobby. He traveled all over the world singing for his screaming fans. The teen magazines were full of his photos. He was a guest on a string of variety shows like The Jack Benny Show and Hullabaloo. Bobby was on top of the world. He was doing everything he'd always wanted to. Singing, dancing, playing his drums. The only thing he hadn't done yet was act. In 1962, Bobby was invited to audition for a film version of the hit Broadway show, Bye Bye Birdie. The show's producers were searching for an actor to play opposite Anne Margaret. Bobby and his dad, Al, flew to Hollywood to meet director George Sidney and screen test for the part of Hugo, the young male lead in the film. The meeting was a short one. Bobby just talked, sang a few songs, and flew back home. But he made a lasting impression. When Bobby got the part for Bye Bye Birdie, uh, we were living in South Philadelphia, and his manager called. I answered the phone. He said, is Hugo there? Once he was cast, Bobby took the time to see the musical on stage and realized Hugo had only one line. What he didn't know was the director and writers on the film were so enthusiastic about his reading that they completely rewrote the part. Can you can't go through with this. How can you let another man kiss you? And in public. I assure you, I won't even feel it. Huh? I'm just a symbol. When we were doing the picture, I think George Sidney saw something between Anne and myself that there was some kind of magic that was happening between us. I think that the chemistry between Bobby and Anne Margaret was so, so perfect that songs were added, lines were added, the whole storyline changed in the movie because of this. <laughs> He's not so much. He has that little, you know, that little devilish look in his eyes when he smiles and uh, like a prankster. Uh, it, it made him perfect for uh, Hugo. Bobby's love song with Anne Margaret, One Boy, One Girl, became a musical hit. Bye Bye Birdie became an emblem for an entire generation. During the filming of Bye Bye Birdie, Bobby was struck by the opportunities that surrounded him. Every other teen idol from South Philadelphia, Frankie Avalon, Fabian, and James Darren, had moved there. The urge to pull up stakes and move to California to pursue his career was strong. I think back at times that maybe I, I should have spent uh, more time on the West Coast than what I did when, when I uh, shot Bye Bye Birdie. I was out there for six months. Uh, because I, I, I think there was, you know, uh, something more uh, to my career other than singing and dancing and playing, you know, uh, different musical instruments. I remember sitting and talking with him, for, you know, filled with questions about the movie and, and, and where, do you, where, are you, where are you going from here, Bobby? And he said, I'm staying right here. He said, you know, they're, they're, it, it's just not for me. I think it was probably the worst career move he could have made. I think the decision for Bobby to stay in Philadelphia is one of the best he ever made. Because you can always move to Hollywood, but they'll chew you up and spit you out in no time. He loved being here in Philly. He loved the He had to be part of the sports scene. This was his home. This was his roots. His family was here, and he didn't want to be away from it. Bobby bid Los Angeles farewell and returned home to Philadelphia. He bought his first house and moved his parents and grandparents in with him. And he moved there with his mother and father. And that was typical then, probably not typical today. But he wanted his children to grow up with grandparents the same way he grew up with grandparents. And that was very, very important to him. And when I've talked to Bobby Rydell there, I mean, 
It's a happy house. He likes his mom and dad there. Happy with his decision, Bobby jumped right back into his music and into the recording studio. And in November of 1963, Bobby released Forget Him. Forget Him rocketed to number four on the Billboard charts and sold over a million records. It became the biggest selling record of Bobby's career. But 1964 would bring a change in the music industry that no one saw coming. A change that would threaten Bobby's livelihood and turn Forget Him into Bobby Rydell's last hit. Biography.com wants to hear from you. Which of these is your favorite Bobby Rydell song? Visit Biography.com and vote now landed in the United States and took over the pop music scene. Their arrival had a devastating effect. All the teen idols, including Bobby Rydell, were suddenly faced with a very bleak future. It captivated everybody, and uh, the teens went to someone else. I mean, you know, you go from Elvis, you go to, 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 to Frankie and, and Bobby and Fabe, and then it was the Beatles. The biggest problem the American entertainers had when the British came, the so-called British invasion, was Nobody cared about our people. Kids were all interested in long hair and a liver puddly in accent. Anything that was English was hot, and anything that was American, with few exceptions, was you know, sort of out there. It's tough times. Those kinds of uh, trends, you know, when, when you're not in the trend, can, can really depress you or take you down mentally. I mean, it did, I think, everyone. Um, but, uh, you know, you go into other things. The teen idols of the late 50s and early 60s had to find new venues in which to perform and new ways to put food on the table. Bobby was the main support for his family. And while there had always been a lot of hit records, there was not a lot of money. Bobby had been depending on having a long career, but at 22, he was shot out of the hit-making machinery. So what happened to the Bobby Rydells and all the teen idols and the Leslie Gores and the Brenda Lees? Uh, they had problems for a while. We, they had to find their, a new niche. For Bobby, television came to the rescue. Based on the acting work he had done in Bye Bye Birdie, Bobby appeared in a dramatic role in combat. With his skill at impersonation, Bobby became a regular part of television variety shows like Milton Berle and The Joey Bishop Show. That was some neighborhood we came from, wasn't it? Mm, rough I'll neighborhood. You, South Philadelphia produced a lot of great talent, though. A lot of great talent. There was uh, old people like Jimmy Dyron. That's right. Uh, Buddy Greco. Buddy Greco. Uh, there was Fabian. Frankie Avalon. Oh, boy, a lot of great people. Hey, uh, how come you never made it? <laughs> But the show that was closest to his heart was the Red Skelton Show. Bobby and Red developed a very close relationship. He had just lost his son, Richard, via leukemia. And, of course, I think I was a little bit older than Richard. I think Richard was about 15 years old when he died, unfortunately. And, and Red took me under his wing like, like I was his, his son. Skelton, a very loving man, warmed to Bobby's gentle nature and recognized his talent. He allowed Bobby to do something he never let any other performer do on his show, imitate him. Cecil Barker said to me, I understand that you would do an impression of Red. Yeah, I said, yeah, I do uh, Clem, Clem Cadiddlehopper. So I started going through this, and Red hears me. He stops what he's doing, looks over at me, and he starts, you know, you know, and from what I understand, I was the only guy to ever mimic one of Red's characters on the show, and I played his cousin, Zeke Kididdlehopper. Although Bobby continued to perform on television, it was a poor substitute for performing live for an audience. However, there was a silver lining to being off the hit parade. Now that he was no longer a teen idol, Bobby didn't have to be available to every girl in America. He was free to publicly declare his love for Camille. Bobby and I dated for 10 years before we were married, but he became famous about a year after we started dating. I found that each time that I went away, you know, I was not just dating her, but I was really falling in love with her and really wanted to get married. After a decade of dating, Bobby and Camille were married on October 5, 1968. With his personal life in order, Bobby also got a break in his career when he met up once more with his lifelong idol, Frank Sinatra. I remember seeing him at the Sands in Las Vegas, and this is when he went from Capitol to his own label, 
reprise. He said, Robert, I'd, uh, I'd like to have you on my label. I said, what time do you want me there, Mr. S., Mr. Sinatra? You know, you know, do you want me to pay you? I'll, you know. So I, I, I signed with Reprise, and, uh, but he was, uh, he, he was great. He was, he was really great to me. But his friendship with Frank was not enough. Bobby left Reprise Records after his first releases with the company failed to hit the charts. With no recording possibilities, Bobby Rydell began traveling to whatever venue would hire him in order to support his family. Although he had chosen to stay in Philadelphia, Bobby was now on the road most of the time. He missed the birth of his first child, Robert, because he was performing in the Catskill Mountain Resorts of New York. I called her from the turnpike, and I forget what time it was, you know, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, and she said, uh, we have a baby boy. Whoa, hello there. Camille and Bobby welcomed a second child, Jennifer, in February of 1974, a birth Bobby made sure to attend, but he didn't stay home long. With a young family to support, paying the bills meant life on the road, a series of one-night stands and living out of a suitcase. Camille was left to keep the family going on what little they had. The jobs were fewer and far between, so it was difficult. You have to downsize and you try to continue living the way you do and uh, you sell investments when you have to and then you put them back when you can again. My wife uh, is the one who raised uh, my two children, uh, Robert and Jennifer. Uh, she was the one who was always there for them because I was on the road 90% of the time. You know, somebody's got to earn the groceries. So whatever was there, you took. Even though Bobby had a hectic travel schedule, he made sure that his children back in Philadelphia had a normal life. I was always a Ritterelli, never a Rydell. That's how everybody knew us, as the Ritterellis. Everything was very normal in our lives. We grew up as normal kids. Um, just like uh, somebody's dad goes to work as a salesperson, our dad was on the road. I think it was just the way we were brought up. We have a very close-knit family. I like to um, teach that to my children, that, you know, that family is the most important thing. He never worked Christmas Day, came home Christmas Eve, but never worked Christmas Day. Since he was now entertaining in smaller venues, Bobby wanted to get away from singing his teen idol music, but the booking agents only wanted his early hits. Bobby felt a little trapped being in the rock and roll era only because people won't accept him as anything else. Bobby basically went to work in the nightclubs, and, which he loved because he was able to do what he wanted to do. Uh, his career became more of what he wanted to do creatively, but unfortunately that era had passed. He tried many, many different types of music uh, for years, uh, recorded on numerous labels. Um, nothing really worked. In the late 1970s, disco had taken over the airwaves. By the early 1980s, the American economy was in recession. Many of the nightclubs that were his lifeblood were either turned into discotheques or shut down. Gigs were sporadic at best. One day, Bobby would play the most exclusive cabaret in town. The next, he would headline in a seedy dive. But no matter what the stage, he always did the show. He was always enthusiastic. He gave the audience a great show. He's still doing it. That's the secret of his success. Bobby, uh... He's one of these rare individuals that loves what he's doing, that loves his audience. Bobby Rydell had spent years on the road taking whatever work came his way, eking out a living for himself and his family. But Bobby Starr was about to rise again. His enthusiasm and perseverance would eventually pay off. You are watching Bobby Rydell. Struggling to maintain a career. The nightclubs that had sustained him for years were shutting their doors and he had to travel greater distances in order to perform and support his family. Bobby had been touring the country alone when music manager Dick Fox came to him with a brilliant idea. I created a show in 1985 called The Golden Boys of Bandstand. Why nobody ever thought about it before, uh, I, I really don't know. But here we are, three Italian kids from South Philadelphia. Robert Ritterelli, Fabian Forte, and Frankie Avalone. He said, boy, these three guys were, you know, big teenage idols, you know, back then. Put them together, you know? And he called me, called Frank, called Fade, and we all said, hey, you know what? 
That sounds like fun. That sounds like it'd be a heck of an idea. This was 1985. show opened. It opened in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. I'll never forget it. The crowd went nuts. To see these three handsome, still handsome guys from their own basically close by hometown, um, to still be looking and sounding so great. That first year, I believe we, we had done like 105 concerts of that one show, and it was, a, it was, like, it was like the 50s again with the screaming women and, and the, the standing ovations and the sellout crowds. It was just a, it was a phenomenon that happened. The show was an instant success from downbeat. I mean, the people just went nuts seeing the three of us together on stage. Golden Boys of Bandstand injected new life into Bobby's career. He began to do guest appearances on television shows, including The Facts of Life and My Two Dads. Back in the spotlight, Bobby was attracting an even wider audience, singing a whole range of music. Bobby threw himself into performing before adoring crowds. He loves to sing, and he loves to perform, and he loves to do it in the way that it used to be, that he's allowed to do it as it used to be. And I'm talking about still with the big band, still with the tuxedo, and still goes out there and works like a pro. On October 15, 1995, Bobby received the ultimate recognition from his hometown. They named a street after him. The day that uh, Bobby Rydell Boulevard was unveiled, the street signs were unveiled and the ceremony proceeded with a trolley car ride. All of Bobby's family and friends were, were on a trolley car that rode down 11th Street, South 11th Street, which was the street he was born and raised on. Thousands of neighbors came out of their home, homes and uh, had pictures in their windows of Bobby, balloons, we love you. The mayor helped Bobby unveil the street signs. It was thrilling. It was, I, was, I don't think I've ever been so amazed by anything in my life. Any outpouring of love that those neighbors showed just, just blew me away. I think that South Philadelphia and my family in general have um, given me all the respect and warmth and love I think that one can have from coming from such a great neighborhood. He is um, one of the few of the 60 South Philadelphia teen idols who stayed in the area, who stayed in Philadelphia. And I think it meant something to him and to um, the people in the neighborhood to um, to tell the world that this is where Bobby Rydell came from. Bobby Rydell's career was finally back on track. But in the winter of 2000, Bobby lost the man who had given him that career. Al Ritterelli, his father, died December 14, 2000. He just kind of gave me the, the, the goosebumps, you know. The relationship with Bobby Rydell and his dad was unlike any other relationship that I've seen with, with father and son. On, on a great, great uh, positive way, Al loved Bobby. He saw in his son a long, long time ago, more than anybody else did. He saw that he had loads of talent and he, before he, he died, he still said, wow, you have so much to give, Bobby. What my, fa what my father meant to me in my career was, I mean, it's, it's, it's so hard to put it in words. Uh, he was a, he was my champion. Uh, a buddy. A good friend. It's 
sometimes you gotta let go. I, uh, I miss him dearly, you know. But uh, he was my best friend. Today, Bobby Rydell continues to tour with the Golden Boys of Bandstand. We figured, nah, we'll do it maybe a year, two years tops, it's over. We're still doing the Golden Boys of Bandstand, and the people are still loving it, and we have an absolute ball when we do it on stage. It's a great show. Anybody who's ever seen the show, I think they would tell you that the three of us together put on, because we're just trying to have fun. It's a great show. The three of us together is, there's nothing like it, really. It's a very, very special experience for our, for our fans. Uh, working with Bobby on that is uh, very special to me. Live performing for Ritterelli is, uh, is, the, is the, the, the pinnacle, the epitome of, of, of his being, you know. I, I think he's the happiest when he's on stage. With his cherished wife Camille by his side, children and grandchildren nearby, Bobby Rydell continues to record and perform the music of his life, songs of love, friendship, and family. The thing about Bobby Rydell is how it always amazed me, even when he was a kid, he had a great career going, but he knew that wasn't the most important thing to him. Getting through life and being happy was the most important. Ready, Tristan? Ready, Rod? Here we go. All right. He still lives in Philadelphia. There was a water trough on, on 12th and Dickinson. I said, if you drank out of it, you became a singer. If you drank out of it and you put your feet in it, you became a singer, a dancer, and an actor. It was a wonderful water trough. It was like, it was like a wishing well. It was the fountain of youth. Or <laughs> I think Bobby Rydell is one of the great entertainers. I think he's one of the best singers ever. You know, I mean, a lot of good singers came out of Philly. But Rydell is really, I mean, to me, he's like one of the best. They give him a standing ovation every single performance. Bobby has survived for only one reason. He's got it. And he's, he does it all. There's a hidden tribute to Bobby Rydell in the hit musical Grease, which is set in 1959. Much of the action takes place in and around the high school, which the producers named Rydell High in his honor. Next on A&E, stay...